wonderful. Okay, well, I think uh, let's get going. Uh, so thank you for everyone for joining us today and welcome to today's webinar, uh, focused on wellbeing for all. Um, I'm really delighted uh, that you can all join us. Um, as an introduction, my name's Caroline. I'm the Chief Marketing Officer here at On Hand and I'll be moderating today's session. Uh, we do want this to be as interactive as possible, so please do use the chat function to share your thoughts with the panellists. We also do have around 10 to 15 minutes at the end for a QA. and a uh, So I'm really delighted to be joined by a fantastic panel uh, with a real wealth of expertise in this area. Um, I'm just going to hand over to you now, uh, to the panel, just to give a quick introduction and a bit of background. So, Gethin, if I could come to you first. Hi, everyone. My name is Gethin Nadin. I'm Chief Innovation Officer for two companies, Benefex and Zellis. Um, I'm also uh, an ordering psychologist and a best-selling HR author with a heavy lean towards employee well-being and have a role kind of uh, helping the UK government uh, sort out workplace wellbeing as well. So interested to have this conversation with you all today. Thanks, Gethin. Uh, Charlie, if I could come to you next for a quick intro. Thanks, uh, thanks guys. Uh, my name's Charlie. Uh, my job title is still being worked out. I am the founder of uh, one of the uh, largest wellness and fitness communities uh, in the UK. I'm growing across Europe. Um, I'm largely just a pretty regular person uh, who, who enjoys running and wellness. Thank you, Charlie. And Sanjay, if I could hand over to you, please. Thank you. I love that introduction. I'm, I'm a pretty regular person. I hope I am a pretty regular person as well. Hi there, everyone. I'm Sanjay from On Hands. Uh, I guess the CEO and founder uh, on hand. I, I know what Charlie means about titles. It's all a bit weird when you when you start something up. Um, delighted to be here and wonderful seeing uh, the comments coming through on the chat and where everyone's from. Uh, looks like we've gone international with uh, people attending today, so that's very cool to see. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, so uh, to kickstart us, Geffen, I'd like to come to you first. Uh, could you give us a bit of an overview of what the state of workplace well-being is as we enter 2024? Yes, of course. So, uh, yeah, barely a few weeks in and it already feels like a lot has happened. Um, I think as it stands, there are two pretty big stats that really illustrate the state of the nation's well-being. Um, we, we've entered 2024 with average sick days now at levels we haven't seen in 30 plus years. The average employee this year will take upwards of about eight days off sick. Um, but we've also seen the economic inactivity due to long term ill health has now also reached pretty record highs. Uh, if you take the UK as example, there's just short of about three million people off work due to things like uh, chronic illness and long term sickness. If you put that in context, that means about five percent of the entire country is now on long term sick leave. I mean, I'll say that again, five percent of the entire country is on long term sick leave, which is it's. It, you know, it's ridiculous how we allowed ourselves to get to this uh, position. Um, and I think two of the primary reasons behind that increase is, and if you look at the data, is kind of stress and worsening mental health, um, which leads me to the second point I think is worth making at the start of this year, that mental health in the UK is now a national emergency. Um, the NHS Confederation itself says that mental health has slipped down the priority list for the country, and as a result, people are worse off. Um and even related to this, I was reading something yesterday from Mental Health UK. Um, they published a burnout report for 2024. And in it, 91% of UK adults said they experienced high or extreme levels of pressure and stress at some point in the last 12 months. And half of those say that their employer doesn't have a plan to deal with that. Um, and of those that said the employer didn't have support, a third of them said, um, I don't actually know where to access the support that might be afforded to me. Um, and that whole situation, I think, is compounded by the fact there just isn't the support available for the people that need it. Um, in the UK alone, 20% of mental health nurse roles are currently vacant. When it comes to NHS mental health care, the NHS relies more on locum doctors than any other area of the NHS. And what that means is that mental health care in the UK is really understaffed, overworked and very underfunded. Uh, and a quarter of those who need mental health support on the NHS will now be waiting more than 12 weeks. Um, I think at the last time I looked at the figures, I'm not sure exactly sure how much has changed. There's about 2 million people on the NHS waiting list just for mental health services. Um, the reasons behind all of these figures, I think, is quite complex. You know, people seek support for mental health for a variety of reasons. People are off work sick for a variety of reasons. 
but we are we can see from the data we are still trying to recover from the 2008 financial crash we're still recovering from the pandemic and we're still recovering and kind of living in the cost of living crisis um and so it's no surprise that well-being kind of remains at the top of the agenda for both employers and employees um and our latest research at benefix found exactly the same thing actually the number one priority for employees is to work with an employer that supports their well-being and one of the number one uh uh, priorities for HR people is to deal with that increasing well-being problem. So a challenging year ahead, I think, for those working in the well-being space. Um, but it shows us really that actually the work isn't done. We might talk about well-being a lot, but as we enter this year, the situation's got worse. And I think it's got worse because we've done nothing about it, quite frankly. We've talked a good talk, but it's time to kind of put some of that stuff into action. So, yeah, some, some huge uh, stats there, Gavin, and, you know, really does paint a picture of where we're at and where we need to get to. Um, but in terms of, I guess, moving the dial and changing tactics, um, um, there's some surprisingly simple ways that we can do this. Uh, Charlie, maybe if we can come to you next. Um, it would be great if you could tell us a bit about Run Social, why you started it and how, how this has taken off. If Charlie's there. <laughs> You're on mute, Charlie. Correct, I am. Classic. Way to do that in front of 200 people, Charlie. Um, so it's a pretty sad uh, story, really. I, I didn't really have much money. Um, I didn't really have many friends. I didn't have a girlfriend. And I worked in like a, a really high pressure sales environment, but a pretty small office. So access to new people or to friends or to just meet people was 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 kind of not out of my reach. I couldn't afford to do it, so I didn't have the means to go and meet people. Um, so I just started to post on LinkedIn that uh, we would start going for like a quite a casual 5K jog every Wednesday from London Bridge. Um, and we decided to deliberately make it free uh, and we had no sign up. We made it as easy as possible for people to join and uh and uh quite slowly people started to just show up like in running kits in the middle of london bridge in winter to come and meet for a chat and a jog and that's basically how it started and and, and you know how it got going amazing Thank, thanks charlie yeah that's good that's great great to hear um and sanjay i'd love to bring you in here i mean in terms of uh kind of what Gaffin and Charlie have spoken about. I don't know if you have any thoughts to share or if you'd like to speak about anything in terms of volunteering and, um, you know, how, how this can be quite a simple way to, and a simple tactic to use. Yeah, totally. So um, I think all of what we've heard so far is really interesting, right? So Gaffin's setting out to the state of well-being as we enter 24 and, and the, the problems that we, we all face and our HR teams will face, um, we all face as individuals. Um, combined with something like Charlie's got, which is a, a simple idea that actually moves the dial. Um, so I think I think all of that's interesting. I think the background um, everyone attending will know is lots of employees have spent a lot of money on well-being too, right? So there's that combination of the pressure pressure's actually growing. Companies are, you know, with the right intention, spending money on well-being stuff, but it isn't particularly landing. And so exploring the idea of well, what else is there that's actually simple, effective? Um, and perhaps free. I think I think that would be a wonderful discussion for us. Um, uh, talking about on on hand in, in particular, and what what we do, um, we started very much in a volunteering space to try and help older adults in your local neighbourhood. And the whole idea was it was based on your exact location, and it was micro. So we were trying to break from uh, traditional volunteering, which was like half day or full day out of the office, which of course has very low take up because people don't have the time to do that. And so the idea is that you can make it really simple because it's in your location and it's micro. So it's like small bite-sized chunks that immediately broke through the barrier of, um, I don't have time to do this. Um, I can't spare the time. There's work with too much work pressure. And my guess is that that kind of feeling is probably similar with some of the wellbeing benefits that have been put in, been put in place over the last couple of years. Actually, employees don't have the time to engage with them um, and, and are struggling to engage with. We, we put in places things like coaching. We think that's wonderful, but actually the take rates are... Um, are lower than we'd like. Um, and I'm guessing that's that's similar for other companies too. Um, some of the things we worked on on hand is um, on, on, on volunteering was it was really that that time pressure, which I think um, transcends all of the the, the, the different types of um, uh, solutions that we, we've, we've all been putting in place. 
And more and more we've worked towards, can we really kill off the time that's needed to take the action? And so I'll give an example. Um, um, I, something I do every week when I when I do my uh, my, my my food shopping, um, I'll always miss something. We do it online, fine, but I always miss something. So I've got to go to the local shop, right? Which I'm guessing most of you do too. And when I do that shop, I'll always buy an extra bag of pasta, right? It's it's less than a pound. It's it's tiny, and I'll drop it in the food baskets for like food donations on my way out. And it's it's like that's zero time as as an example of something that takes zero time to do. It's very simple, pretty low cost, um, and I think there's very similar. Uh, things we can all be encouraging on well-being and they, do, they don't need to be the complex expensive stuff they can be very similar to what charlie's um, been describing and i'd love to hear more about but what about walking meetings can we massively encourage walking meetings how do you do that you've got to start with your managers because they're the ones setting up meetings encourage them to do walking meetings i work for an american company campus based and they had you know a large area they could walk around and, and that's where i first saw it uh, we can do the same. We can do the same in cities in the UK. There's, 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 yeah, you've got to dress appropriately for the weather, but I, I think we can do that. What about lunch times? What about putting, putting your device away, encouraging your team to put their device away when they take their lunch break? Actually, taking the lunch break is the first step, but the second step, leave your phone when you go for your lunch break. Um, maybe you can go for a walk, whatever it is. But there's, there's simple, uh, cost effective, easy things that are zero cost. Um, um, last comment. We'll come back to it is well how do you make those things a habit and that's that's the trick but we'll, we'll come back to that um brilliant well great great to see um there's some people in the chat who are already doing walking meetings so it sounds like that's quite a popular idea um geffen um i know you you've mentioned before um uh, some, of, some of the ideas that Benefex is looking to implement this year uh, to make people use uh, well-being products in work time i don't know if you just wanted to touch a bit on that yeah, I think um, Sandra and Charlie's points are really valid that um, it, I, th I do think we operate in a world where a lot of this stuff can look expensive and difficult to do. And, you know, if you take the the role of uh, the global head of well-being or domestic head of well-being role internally at an employer, that role looks quite different from one organisation to the next. Some of those people are quite strategic with board attention and budget. Others, it's effectively an internal comms role. And so some well-being people do not have a budget to go and actually do some of the things they need to do. But all these little things that Sanjay mentioned, what you know, that is developing a culture of well-being. And so you're instilling in your people and your managers the way you operate, the whole employee experience. How is this conducive to good well-being? And so that's, you know, whether that's walking meetings, whether that's periods of the day where you black out meetings, you know, across the Zalis group, we tell everyone that they're not allowed to book a meeting between 12 and one. People have to prioritize their lunch break. They need time for themselves. And we understand that's an important part of their productivity is them being well and happy and attentive at work. And so those things, lots of employers can do. And actually that's really, really strong for their well-being. Um, for us at Benefits, um, obviously one of the core products we've got is employee benefits. We've been doing that for 14 years I've been at the company for 13 years and we've known for some time that the benefits you offer can significantly contribute to your well-being um, we actually even know from the last five years of all the data we have that there are certain employee benefits which act not only as kind of short-term responsive methods to help somebody in crisis but also long-term preventative so there are benefits people can take that change some of these habits that change people's awareness and knowledge of well-being that actually five years later they're better off because they're able to prevent stuff or buffer themselves and so we, as I think most employers, you know, based on those stats I shared at the start, we don't want to wait for people to get ill and then offer them help. We actively should be trying wherever we can to prevent people from getting ill. And that's really difficult for employers to do because you're basically trying to get somebody to spend money on doing something now for a future that is not guaranteed. And, you know, I've gone back to university a month ago to study public health uh, and social policy. And it's exactly what the government does. The government acts really well in a crisis. So the pandemic's a perfect example of that, um, but isn't very good at thinking, what do I need to do now that's going to help in five years' time? Because it might be another government. It might be another government in control. And you know, the government doesn't think long term. They're quite reactive. And I think employers uh, act in the same way. Um, so we have these high levels of absence rates in the UK because few employers take that preventative view. And if they or the government did, those figures wouldn't be rising as rapidly and as steeply as they are. And some examples of how we see benefits helping people be well for longer and acts as these kind of preventative measures. 
Um, we know that the data we have shows us that people who have access to and use medical insurance tend to proactively look after their health and well-being more. In 2024, two in 10 UK employees say they offer to health offer health insurance uh, in, in, for the first time as a response to the NHS waiting lists and, the, and those rising uh, figures. Um, your teeth are often an indication of your overall health and can be a predictor of things like cardiac arrest. So dental insurance is another great benefit that encourages proactive management and health and well-being. Um, and an area that we've really kind of dipped into, uh, we launched a new well-being product back in October. Uh, we've heavily invested in this workplace well-being platform. Um, it's called One Her Wellbeing, and it's what we call a low-intensity digital well-being platform. And that's designed to help employees manage stress and improve their mental health. And these types of employer-sponsored mental health platforms result in as much as 25% fewer missed workdays. And one review of hundreds of studies found that these types of platforms significantly reduce the impact of poor mental health and subsequently absent rates. But to the point I think will probably come across quite a lot in this, this call today is this isn't about fixing people, it's about reducing the numbers of people who are at risk. Um, and I think for decades we've given oil to the squeakiest wheel and ignored everyone else and we've just watched I mean, one of the things I talk about in my book is this idea that we're watching cars crashing and then pulling our people from the wreckage without actually going further up the road to see why people are crashing in the first place. So our platform is entirely designed for employers to use at work during work time and is viewed as a tool that gets everyone, regardless of how much how well they'd rate their well-being, to a better place or, or what we call optimum employee functioning. So we're not a crisis platform. We're here to help employees live and work better and give them the tools and education to be better off at their jobs and happier in their lives. And education in almost every model of health behaviour change is a precursor to change. Um, and I think also, you know, lots of the problems that people go through, lots of the reasons why people are really stressed at the moment, why people's mental health has got worse, employers can't fix that. The pandemic is a great example of that. We, can't, we can lessen the effects and the negative effects of those life events like divorce and relationship breakdown and debt and a pandemic or cost of living crisis but people will still go through those you could be the most positive and progressive employer in the world with a great culture of employee well-being your people will still get mental health problems your employees will still go through divorce and have all these stressful life events so it's more about how do we help people deal with the stuff and the challenges of life throws at us rather than fixing them um and you know thankfully even just a couple of months since we launched we've got some really good large employer case studies to show how we've improved outcomes for employees. And we've also had a research published in a scientific journal that demonstrates the positive impact, which is quite rare in this industry to have, you know, academic proof that the, the platform works. Oh, amazing, Gethin. Thank you. Lo loads of insights there. And I think some great examples uh, for everyone on the call today to, to think about. Um, I just want to come back to the, uh, now, um, the idea, Charlie, around run social. Um, and it feels like there's a great way that you're kind of creating a social connection there. Um, maybe could you just touch on some of the ways you're looking to kind of encourage people to spend time together at, at the meetups? Sure, yeah. So when, when I used to work in uh, for, for other companies and used to use wellbeing products, and, uh, et cetera, you're, a lot of them are moving into like the tech space, in the tech world where you have an app or you have like a browser or something you have to log into to do. Um, and, uh, you know, you're often competing with like notifications against people's TikTok or their LinkedIn or their Instagram. So you could be doing all you want to do with your calm, mindful app, trying to meditate, and then your phone's going bing, 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 bing. bing. In your pocket it's just an impossible space to try and compete with like I, to, no matter what you do i found myself getting distracted uh anyway from technology so we took the absolute opposite stance and we're like well we're not gonna have uh, or we're gonna encourage people not to bother using their phones or or any technology when you're focusing on your well-being so now we have about six, uh, well, now 7,000 people across the country who turn up on Wednesdays. And part of our safety briefing before we go out for quite a casual 5K walk or jog, dependent which group you go for, is that we just request that for half an hour, you just don't use your phone. Uh, and we try to remind people like the simple benefits of like feeling like a child again, like learning to connect without having to be uh, drinking and actually learning how to have a conversation with another human that you don't know, not with the blanket of loud music in a pub or a bar or not with the safety net of being behind the telephone screen. 
you actually have to go out and learn to have like a proper conversation and that's been a bit of a highlight that we really really uh, have had good feedback on um is actually actively encouraging people not to talk about and uh, not not to post about our platform and what we do and what we've created and that if they've enjoyed it go and have a conversation with someone about it at work or you know tell your friends or tell whoever but uh, you know for half an hour please 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 just go and have a chat and and disconnect from everything that's meant to be keeping you connected and and that's been completely fortuitously because it's not based on data it was just something that we plucked out the sky from how we felt in, you know through our intuition when we first started that we were really keen on doing was how can we make it as easy as possible with limited or no tech involved to get people out and being connected and and that's probably been our like luckiest stroke was was taking the opposite approach to say like nike or gymshark who ask people to post about them when they turn up tag at you know on running or even our sponsors hoka we ask people to do the exa exact opposite and just if you have fun go and tell people the old school way um, and don't bother with your phone just keep it in your pocket or even better leave it at the meet point um and that, that's been a real you know uh, lucky point for for fostering real social connection real friendships and basically forcing people into uncomfortable situations that they haven't been in for four five six years where you've had the comfort of your own armchair and your own laptop or you know even when it comes to sort of dating you had like bumble or uh, tinder or whatever all the other apps were where you could say something and not have to be worried about the repercussions of your conversation same with instagram if you were trying to meet people or tiktok whatever you you had that safety net i just completely removing that and saying right you know you have to go and be a an old school human and have a chat it's just quite daunting and it was quite tough but people have really bought into it and that's probably been our number one way that it's taken off is you know people foster real connections because you have real conversations talking about genuine emotions to people who are relative you know strangers at the time who then become friends and that's what the attraction is as you come back to meet your friends each week wonderful charlie yeah some really, really um insightful ways there for you know going removing the technology and having kind of those one-to-one -one com um, conversations sanjay did you have some thoughts that you wanted to add there yeah i'd love to um so Char charlie's quite modest but uh, lots of folks on the call may not have heard of run run social um if you haven't please do check them out charlie maybe you can drop a link uh, for the best best place to check out run social into the chat um, but what he's done is he's created what essentially is a running club, right? That, was, that doesn't sound particularly exciting. But when you check out what they do, it's, it's immense. It's not about running's the excuse, right? It's all about social connection. Uh, like like Charlie said, he started on London Bridge, but now I don't know how many sites, but it's across the UK. It's now international. We're talking thousands, if not tens of thousands, getting in uh, people getting involved. Uh, running is the excuse to turn up, but really it's about if you're new in a city and you don't have friends, a bit like Charlie describing his uh, starting point. It's a place to go and meet people up and mega vibe is what's one of the one of the folks is just dropping into the uh, into the chat. It is. It's really cool when you when you see the photos. It's like I can't wait to go to one of these. It's um it's a um, amazing activity. But really, it's fostering social connection. And that's um uh, if I talk about volunteering, that that's the big thing about volunteering. If you if you've done a good deed, I'm sure everyone on this call has done a good deed at some point in life. You feel good. It's a dopamine hit. It's it's like you know posting on. Instagram and getting thousands of uh, reactions. It's it's that kind of dopamine hit you, you get from helping out someone around the corner, uh, doing a, a good deed for someone who's homeless, doing something for youth mentoring, whatever it is, you, you get an instant hit from that kind of stuff. Um, lots of studies on the chemistry behind it. I failed all of my science stuff, but it's it's the dopamine, it's endorphins, it's all of that, all of that, all of that really good stuff. Um, I'll talk some more about how uh, there are so many interventions these days um, um, there was a great, um, well, I I'll say it's great, but um, there's a, there was, a, I guess, a database study from Oxford University's uh, Wellbeing Research Centre last year, and I think they've just republished it again uh, this month. Um, and they talked to volunteering. Um, it's really hard to prove, right, what, which things have the, the right kind of impacts. And we'll come back to that topic because I'm not sure all of them need to have massive impact to be actually impactful. But for volunteering, it's one of the only ways that that um, the evidence shows as um, well-being benefits at work. And that's because, you know, belonging is probably one of the biggest pieces for well-being. And it's uh, certainly one of the greatest drivers for positive well-being in the workplace. Um, so, yeah, uh, I, I guess social connection, huge for us. 
Um, we get that through volunteering. And I, I love the way Char Charlie's been fostering that through Run Social, which essentially is a, a social connection club across the UK. I encourage folks to check that out too. Brilliant. Yeah, it's great to see on the chat some other uh, charities and ideas being shared with everyone. Uh, so thanks for sharing that. I'm sure very useful for everyone to see what everyone else is up to. Um, so we've spoken quite a lot about the workplace and um, Gethin, you've touched on this slightly, but are there some shifts that we should all be taking at an individual level? Yeah, I mean, first of all, if, I think if you look at the fact that um, you know, I'm in a world where we have things like employee benefits that support well-being. We have this um, low intensity intervention well-being platform, all heavily evidence based that they they move the dial when it comes to individual well-being. Those things are not in conflict with uh, on hand or on social. So they are complementary to those things. So you know, well-being is a very broad church. Right. And it changes all the time. We have very diverse organizations. There is not one uh one size fits all approach you don't choose one well-being tool roll it out and that will solve all the problems for all the people um you know i think without a doubt the single biggest thing we can do to improve our well-being is to spend time and quality time with other people you know we there are u.s studies spanning decades that followed the lives of men to find out what had the biggest impact on their health and happiness throughout their lives and it was family and friends that came out top and I think it's part of the reason why the hybrid conversation persists and why it's really hard for us to find the right balance because working from home for some people makes them less stressed and saves them money and it makes the relationships better and helps the household. But at the same time, spending time in person with our team members, interacting with them, spending time with other people, friends, sharing ideas, getting to know each other, really, really critical to our well-being at work. So that's why we partner as an example with, with On Hand, because we think that actually complements a lot of the stuff that we do, because it allows people to spend time with other people. Um, but I think at the moment, um, one of the big challenges, I think, and, and Sandra's kind of alluded to this, and it's it's an area I'm really interested in, is yeah, how do you get people to use this stuff? Um, behaviour change can be really, really hard, um, but a huge part of that health, any health behaviour change really, is getting people to do what they need to do. And I mean, the example that um, Charlie and Sandy just talked about, um, staying at home and watching Netflix after a long day at work when you're tired and a bit stressed out and being staring at a screen is the easier thing to do. You go into a park and meeting up with people and running feels far less attractive to most people than sitting at home watching Netflix, if we're being honest. But that, that's the hard behavior change you've got to do because we all know that sitting home and watching Netflix will not make you feel any better, but going and doing something like one social will. So actually, how do you get people to change? How do you get people to put in what might be perceived as extra effort to do what's right for them? Um, and as I mentioned at the start, you know, um, the reality is most people don't know how to live healthy. We know these heuristics about eight hours sleep, eight glasses of water, five bits of fruit and vegetables. We kind of know all that. Um, we're starting to understand most people that processed foods are really bad for us, but we don't really understand what constitutes processed and what we should avoid. We all know we should be exercising more than we do are generally and sleeping better, but we don't always know or understand what's keeping us from things like quality sleep or exactly what good movement looks like for us. Um, and really interesting, if you look at the data that came out during the pandemic, for many employees, they don't actually understand that they're experiencing poor mental health or struggling in a way that can be avoided. Some really interesting research that came out on men during the pandemic who experienced mental health for the first time. And it was about 20% of men said they experienced poor mental health for the, the very first time. And when they asked them if they did anything about that, they spoke to somebody about it, they said no. And the response generally was, well, everyone's going through this. I'm no special. Everyone's going through this stressor. And so they really didn't identify that what they were going through was a mental health challenge. Um, and I think Sandra mentioned at the start, the other big challenge is, apart from not knowing what to do and what good looks like for them, it's not having the time. You know, employees work long days most most of us have stressful days and long days um we don't necessarily want to spend our leisure time doing something that most of us think of as a little bit harder work so i think it's about how do you focus on getting employees to do something that's very quick and simple and how they can do it and wherever possible at work and so this is really interesting i speak to customers about this um all the time but we have found on our platforms that Five to 15 minutes each day is enough to make a, a material difference to both employee and employer. And we've been able to demonstrate that with scientific evidence from the workplace. So 
just 20 minutes of exercise sat at your desk, so doing what we call desk exercises, will reduce your stress levels at the following two Zoom meetings that you go to. So you will actually contribute more and you'll have a better experience at the next two digital meetings that you go to if you spend 10 to 20 minutes moving at your desk. And that's literally just kind of stretching. Um, and that type of movement also increases the likelihood that you'll have a positive meeting uh, and collaborate with your colleagues. Really interesting stuff as well. Just 20 minutes of journaling at the end of the working day can improve your productivity the following day by 20%. So you all these different things that can happen that can be pretty impactful and significant. And I think this plays to Sanjay's point, which is about what does good take up look like of these things? I mean, um, when I wrote my latest book, which Sanjay kindly wrote um, a section for actually, um, a big part on belonging and spending time with other people. But when I wrote that book, one of the things that kind of came out was as I was trying to explain well-being digital platforms or well-being interventions to my dad, I kind of use the example of if you opened up a new shop and a thousand people came through the door, but nobody bought anything, is that shop a success? And that's what we're doing with lots of these well-being interventions is I get customers phoning me and saying, um, I, I, so I so I built a financial well-being platform a couple of years ago, sold that to lots of benefits customers. One customer called me up one day and said, when he got 15% take up. And I remember saying to that customer, do you think that's bad? And they said, yeah, we think it should be more. And that, for that company, that had worked out that something like one in 15 of their people had been going in and learning some stuff about money. Um, and I said, well, I built the platform and I don't know what good take up looks like. So why are you telling me that 15 percent take up is bad? What's that based on? You know, we have benefits that have one point five percent take up. We've got benefits that have got 50, 60 percent take up. It, weird, it varies widely. And I think it's about how do we get people the help they need when they need it? And sometimes people don't always need help. Um, if anyone who's done counselling will know that I think I did six sessions of counselling before the counsellor told me I was counselling myself, so I didn't need to do it anymore. I might in a couple of years need to pick that up again. But I think we have to destroy this idea that an engagement in a wellbeing platform is somehow um, a measure of its success. If I said you organize, if I went into organization based on the stats I shared at the start and said, I've been able to halve the absence rates of 10 people in your team or 10 people in your company by supporting their well-being more, the return on investment calculation financially would show that was all completely worth the effort. And you've made a material impact to the lives of 10 people. So why is that a bad thing? If the investment is covering itself, if you're helping people move forwards, um, and I don't think I've got anything to add to that, Sandy, but I think it's a conversation that's not being had enough in the well-being space. Yeah, I'm glad glad you raised it. It was one of the thoughts I had for this session. I mean, one of the, one of the uh, highlights we put on the, uh, the invites was look, lots of money has been spent on uh, well-being benefits, but but potentially not having the the impacts. And my question was really around what what about the benefits that are kind of there when you need them? But actually, the take up rates look really low. Is that a bad thing? Uh, and I'm not sure it is. And I think you've just answered that that question perfectly. It's it, it's not a bad thing. It, it, this session isn't about hey, drop everything you've done. None of it's working. Come in with the simple, simple stuff and said it's not that. It's 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 probably have a look at what you've been doing. Some of it doesn't work and may may you may not need it, but some of it, even if it has low take up, probably is a good thing to have because it's there when folks need it. If it's coaching, if it's mental health stress coaching, if it's financial well-being, those things when you need them, they're they're massive. So it, it's certainly not that. Um, I know, Kaz, we're, we're low on time. Can I, can I mention two things on behavior? Yeah, uh, absolutely. Well, just, just for everyone um, listening in, please do send your questions for the Q&A because we'll be starting that very shortly. But Sandy, if you had any final points or, or Charlie or Gethin as well, then we, we can have um, a tiny bit of time for that. Fab, yeah, let's do the final points. Uh, so for me, it's um, there's two things. It's about behaviour change. It's... Um, um, I think the first thing is like this breadcrumb concept. I, I don't think you can expect people to go from like doing nothing, the, the zero, you know, the watching Netflix to the hundred miles an hour, um, immediately getting out there and using all of your platforms. It's about the breadcrumbs you put in place. I know a simple example from on hand is we don't tell people to go volunteering when we, when we launch with a new company. We, we don't, we don't do that. We encourage them to listen into a topic that they care about, a social eco topic. We've recorded actually lots with um, various different speakers, including Geffen and Charlie. Um, but that's what we encourage, the breadcrumb start, the easy, no stress, 10 minute, learn about topic, and then maybe move on to a different type of action. And the second point is about, um, we're talking about lots of things you could potentially start, that, lots of them sound wonderful, the walking meeting's wonderful. Um, the trick then is how you make it a habit. We've started some of that, on the, on, we're using tech to do it, where you can track habits, um, 
um, on the OnHand app. Um, so we, we, we think we can use tech to do that within our service, but how you make the behavior um, become a habit, that's, that's gonna be the next trick. Wonderful, thanks Sanjay. Uh, Charlie or Gavin, any final points uh, to finish this off before we go into Q&A? Uh, yeah, I, just around your own uh, like personal responsibility, around your own well-being too. Um, and like Sanjay says, I think once you can start to encourage people to to create new habits, and the way that you can really do that without tech is to actually encourage positive feelings and emotions in people, um, congratulating people, making them feel really good about going for a half an hour walk on a Wednesday with the rest of the club. And that then slowly opens up more doors for more ventures. And um, and and I just wanted to reiterate that point of Sanjay was, you know, you don't, yeah, it starts with a few very small, low barrier to entry, maybe free things. And that starts the next domino toppling and the next one, the next one, the next one. And you can really help foster that through creating positive emotions so people actually feel good. Because I, I, I truly believe that will get people doing, you know, more than ever, than, than you know, getting a tick on a on a on a sheet, or you know, getting a congratulatory you know, virtual medal or something, um, is being able to foster and and, and really encourage and elevate people's uh, you know feeling good about those basic basic uh, uh, types of activities before you then start to open up to you know make, make do, do, doing the next step and the next step and the next step. So that, that's my two pens. Wonderful. Thank thanks, Charlie. Um... Gethin, I don't know if you had any points to add. I've, I've actually got a question for you, which is maybe more directed to you. Um, but do you, if you've got a yeah. couple of points, please do. Yeah, so there's one thing I kind of want to say. Um, I mean, there's uh, been a new study doing the rounds in the news over the last few weeks about how workplace wellbeing initiatives are failing to move the dial and won't make any difference to employee wellbeing. Um, it's not the first big study to show this, and it won't be the last, but it's been shared a lot on social. And... Um, but as is the case with many of these studies, including this most recent one, um, they're pitching workplace well-being initiatives against things like workload being too high, ambiguous roles, poor leadership. And they're pitching it to suggest that most workplace well-being initiatives are actually an attempt to cover up the mistakes of the company and place the onus on the employee to fix those mistakes. You might have heard of this as well-being washing, and while that kind of, that does exist, the evidence actually only backs that up to um, say that two-thirds of companies aren't actually doing this. So most companies don't do this. But I just get, wanted to say that everything we're talking about today, we aren't pitching apps that help you sleep against quality leadership. Both are an important part of employee well-being. When you develop a great culture of well-being, when you give employees autonomy and manageable workloads, and then you give them well-being support too, you aren't trying to fix them. You're actually trying to optimize them. And as I sit here, if I needed help with stress in the UK, if I was anxious and I needed to calm down or speak to someone, I would be waiting a long time for state support. But within minutes, because of the decisions my employer has made, I can read content written by psychologists, watch videos by personal trainers, nutritionists, speak to a doctor on Zoom, get a free blood test with my income protection policy, or chat with a mental health nurse. And so it's no surprise that the data backs up that in 2024, your workplace has more of an influence on your well-being than your doctor has. So for those that support the latest Oxford study, I would ask you one simple question. If the workplace isn't going to support your well-being, who is? Oh, brilliant, brilliant stuff, Gethin. And so I just I just wanted to uh, come to one of the questions that's come in, uh, just for thoughts from the panellists. Um, so um, econom economically, it's been a tough time for some sectors and companies have been hit hard with redundancies. Uh, this means for the remaining employees, picking up additional responsibilities and pressure has, has been put on and we're all just in survival mode and we've got a really anxious workplace. Um, um, do you have any tips for how we can help our well-being? Hey, I'm happy to jump in there. So first off, hey, sorry to hear that. Um, I don't think you're the only one. There's a lot of redundancies going on in technology over the last year um, that we've seen from like giant giant companies. So you're not you're not the only ones. Um, um, lots of companies go through this. I've certainly been through it a few times in in my career. Uh, the, the straight the, the the first answer is always about time. Time, hopefully. Um, is the biggest healer for that workplace disruption um, that starts. Um, and then it's really about how your workplace can support the people that are still there and feeling feeling that that angst. whole range of things they can do, but uh, yeah, it's, it's hard to know what to 
yeah, it's hard for them really to decide what are the best ways to engage that that remaining workforce. Brilliant. Thanks, Sanjay. And um, one for you, Geffen. Uh, you referred to a preventative wellbeing app. Uh, can, can you just let us know which one that was that you recommended? Yes, yeah, so that's Benefex's One Hub Wellbeing. So used by people like uh, Sendrica, um, VFS Global, Circle K, if you're familiar with that as a grocery chain. Um, yeah, so, but yeah, if, if anyone wants to connect and find out more about that, then just let us know. Brilliant, thanks. And I think we've got time for one or two more questions. Um, so um, I've got one here around uh, the idea of building up social connection um, outside of pub culture in the workforce is really interesting. Apart from uh, walking groups or ideas like run social, uh, do the panel have some other ideas about how we can do this in our workplace? Um, Charlie, do you do you want to do you have any other ideas or thoughts for for the audience? Yeah, sure. I mean, the, the ones you know, I'm a big in real life IRL kind of advocate, and you know, there are plenty of clubs that and communities and spaces where people can go and, and meet them. Um, you know, there's lo lots that we work with on a localized level across the country, but I think some of people, Andy's Man Club is another one that pops up. There's Social Wellness Club, which is ran, which hosts coffee meets every morning at 7 a.m. across the city in London. Um, they're completely free. Uh, people just sign up via uh, I think their website uh, and they don't even have to let anyone know if they're going to come. Uh, and, you, and you can just turn up and just go and meet people for, for free. And there are and honestly an absolute abundance of them. Um, you can find them on uh, on apps like Halo, which is H-E-Y-L-O. I'll post it into the link afterwards. And also uh, Cleek, which is actually uh, C-L-I-Q. And they basically put all of these communities and all of these different types of initiatives that people like myself put on for free across the country for people just to rock up to. Um, and, you know, they don't cost a penny at all, which, uh, you know, which, which and, they, and they cover all sorts of varieties of stuff, whether it's like, you know, there's one in Brighton where they go in the sea every Friday and it's like minus four degrees in the water, which is outrageous for me. But there's other ones where they have book clubs and they do nice one mile walks and stuff like that. But uh, and, they're, and they're a real hub for free to use, free to download. Uh, you can quickly go on, see what's on and you just show up. And it's as simple as that. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Shirley. And um, we've had a great question in for Zoe. I don't know. We've got one minute left, so it might be very uh, top line of what we could touch on here. Um, uh, she's very interested to know um, if uh, a four day working week could play a role in improving employee well-being. Uh, Geffen, I know you have a, a link to an article, which I'm sure will give more insight than we've got for the one minute. But I don't know if you had a couple of top thoughts to leave the audience with today. Yeah, top level, most of the studies that have taken place so far and a review of those by Cambridge University have found really positive impacts, so much so that the overall output for the employees and employers was better than people work in a five day. Um, as we've evolved, the promise of new technology and developments in the workplace have always been that we will have to do less and our lives can be more enriched. Um, we've lived with the eight hour working day five days a week for more than 100 years it's time for a change you know we shouldn't actually be working as much as we currently are um the uk is suffering from a, a very low productivity we've got one of the lowest um productivity levels of any oecd country and still haven't recovered from the lack of productivity caused by the 2008 financial crash so something has to be changed um we know that people working kind of close to and plus 40 hours the amount they achieve past 40 hours a week is, is so insignificant there's just no point in allowing people to work past that point so it's yeah it's time for change and i think all we need really is one big employer because most of the studies have been fairly small employers to take part in a four-day working week but you would have seen in the last couple of weeks most major supermarkets in the uk now offer four-day working weeks where people are saying i'm working a longer day i might be working a 10-hour day but actually the net benefit to individuals of having a longer weekend and anyone who's experienced a bank holiday knows your Friday means you can get your washing and clean the house and then you get a full weekend to yourself. And uh, yeah, I think there's, it's got its objections from people and I think it's still finding its feet. But I would put my hat on the line and say within 10 years, 40% of this country or 40% of knowledge workers at least will be working a four day week.
So it's some great, great thoughts to, to leave us on. Thank you so much. So thank you to all the panellists and for everyone joining us today. Uh, we will be sending out a recording after this session uh, for you. And uh, yeah, I hope it's been useful for everyone. Thank you.